broadcasting uh, on YouTube Live for us. This program, Poetry is Normal, presents. We have an alternating month. We have also have an open mic. Uh, but this program is supported by the Normal Public Library Foundation, and it allows us to bring guest poets in. And tonight, Poetry is Normal presents Laura Bandy and Kara Doris. And we're so glad to have the both of you with us tonight, along with Kara's husky, <laughs> Mona Lisa. And we oh. hope that she'll make an appearance at some point. Let me tell you a little bit about the two poets. They're going to read together in a back and forth kind of way, which will be wonderful. Uh, Laura Bandy got her MFA from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and also attended the University of Southern Mississippi's Center for Writers PhD program. Uh, she's been published in a lot of different literary journals and has this wonderful chapbook hack uh, from Dancing Girl Press. Uh, and she teaches at Spoon River Community College, and she comes from Jacksonville, Illinois, home of the Ferris wheel. Kara <laughs> 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 Doris uh, is also the author of two poetry collections, Have Ruin Will Travel and When the Body is a Guardrail from Finishing Line Press. She also has been, her poetry and her prose have been uh, published in many journals. She got an MFA in creative writing at New Mexico State University and a PhD in literature and poetry at the University of North Texas. She teaches at Illinois College. Uh, and we are delighted to have Kara and Laura with us tonight reading some of their poems. If you discover that you have some questions for them or some comments and you're able to type it right in there at YouTube. Then later in the program, uh, John Fisher will rejoin us and relay those questions to us. I'll probably have some questions of my own. Uh, but I mean, it's all yours, you two. I'm going to mute myself and uh, listen. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank you so much. Um, when Laura and Kathleen suggested we do this reading, I really thought it would be cool to like do dueling poets. And of course we're not dueling, you know, dueling pianos, like <laughs> battling it out. Oh, that'd be great. I know, right? <laughs> I really wanted to say that. I was like, wait, no, well, I'm not really a duelist. I'm, yeah. We're poets. It's, yeah. yeah. But I thought it would be really cool to just do poem after poem and talk about how um, we saw these poems connecting and how one poem inspired us to start another or to read another. And as we were trying to decide what to read, Laura has this great, poem girl detective that she's going to read next and I thought ooh, I love poetry that's about investigation and questions and searching so here is one of my poems from my second collection when the body is a guardrail and it's entitled disappear to Texas she fell into containment the way women and tropical birds fall a recent escapee at Tupelo, she nursed soldiers in DC and skinny dipped waterless on rooftops. What did she know of MP uniforms or the men beneath? The cages that cages come in so much flesh and breath. Then she fell into a fairy tale, a fatherless husband, a mother and seven brothers-in-law, sold gas and sundries at the Dorsey General Store learned we construct cages out of open spaces. Sold loneliness of a dirt road, the company of dog packs and cigarettes. Trust me, she'd say, you learn to romanticize the past. But there is no Dorsey anymore, only a suspension bridge over Ripley Creek, a small Texas town swallowed by another. She remembers the way the store held hostages, how water inside the water tank felt like metal in the sun. You say she should have run away, but where to? Small towns all look the same to the disappeared. Love that. 
Yes, and I have uh, the girl detective, uh, a huge fan in my childhood of Nancy Drew. And um, as a grown-up reader, uh, I discovered through my friend Jody Stanley, um, who is the editor of Ninth Letter Literary Journal, the great writer Kelly Link, who has a story entitled The Girl Detective that's just such an inspiration for me, such a, a kind of touchstone. Um, and so I was thinking of that story when I wrote this. It's also, I think, my supervillain origin story. The Girl Detective. The freezer was at the bottom of the cellar stairs. When I was young, I would go down there in summer and shake from the cold blast, heat rushing behind me, frost numbed and feverish all at once until I couldn't take it, grabbed for lime ices, bomb pops, root beer slush. There were two plastic baggies in the back behind an ancient rump roast. One held an indigo bunting, the other held a scarlet tanager. Fact. My mother was a birder. Fact. We had a large picture window and sometimes birds mistook it for sky. In my spare time, I read encyclopedias which were locked in my father's study. I had a key like Nancy Drew. Fact. Indigo buntings are indigenous to Southern Canada, a brilliantly blue bird of old fields and roadsides. Fact. Scarlet tanagers are natives of the Eastern interior and despite vivid coloring might be overlooked because of rather secretive behavior. Sometimes I would remove the birds from their clear casings and climb back up the cellar steps into the yard with one in each hand. Mid August, the wind would whip over our scorched cornfields and blow the weather vane and circle so fast it blurred, becoming every direction. Thank you so much. I love that. Um, I think maybe it's not showing up on YouTube and there are people trying to view us right now. I, I did a quick test. I'm able to view it on YouTube, but I'll I'll just I'll just make certain that it's still playing currently. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Looks like it's working. Do you want to use, my... yeah, use the link? Okay, I might have been the wrong link, knowing me. Yeah, I'm not the only one on. Thanks, Jerry. I know, right? I knew as soon as I put the link on somewhere that it would be the wrong link. <laughs> yeah. I just, and I double checked it, and it was the countdown, but I don't know. Maybe it changed. But yeah, I see us on there. We, we are exist. there. We exist. we exist, absolutely. And to reassure you, if people have trouble uh, watching it live, it'll be recorded and archived. So if they missed a little bit at the beginning, they can come back and hear those two poems. Right. At their, okay. at their poetry leisure. Right. Thanks, Kathleen. Yes, thank you. All righty. So I, um, next I was thinking about reading... Um, a couple poems from my first book called Have Room and Will Travel. And I was thinking a lot of like the girl detective and what it's like to be a girl trying to figure out how to live and, you know, the girl body. Um, the girl. I know, the girl, yeah. And in my first collection, there are a lot of poems that are about my experience one summer when my friend and I traveled through Russia. So we went from Moscow and we did the Trans-Siberian Railway all the way down through Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar, and then down into Beijing, China. And we spent days upon days of like endless train rides and met a lot of interesting people and had a lot of interesting discussions. Um, and so my whole collection is a little bit about blurring the past and the present and how you have to move away from something oftentimes to see it. So this is called Our Two, and it's in two sections. One. Sarah says Distort distortion lives within us, that only you can pass your own street three times. Three times I had to say no, not this turn, what no one knows. We were slouched down kissing, me and my first boyfriend. His mom was driving. Every time I peeked, it was never my street, never a name I recognized, as if the street sign was as buried as I was. You could pass your own again and again and never know. I asked Sarah, 
Can you mourn what you've never known? The street we lived on in St. Petersburg was under construction. A face looked I can't trust. If it can't recognize itself, how can I? Not even a church escapes plastic surgery. It's onion top reaching for heaven and failing. And then two. The train window distorts. Through the slant of dirt and speed, I see lavender weeds, lizard tongues. I brought my mother as she lived. I brought my mother these lizard tongues as she lived like mountains in the rear view, like nesting dolls twisting smaller versions out until none are left. Associations like these are purple allergies that imprint themselves and haunt us through blood and coughing. When we hold those stems like a bouquet, they droop over our knuckles, covering the clothes that holds them in place. Like that single black swan, a sunspot, that spent weeks courting and flirting a white paddle boat five times its size. He said he didn't want to leave her side. A local man, a divorce sailing instructor said, it seems like he, the swan, has fallen in love. In town, people murmur, He'll figure it out sooner or later. But he won't, you know, Sarah says. Swans mate for life. <laughs> I love trains uh, and the movement of that and those nesting dolls. <laughs> and thinking about girls and living in a girl body. Uh, this next poem is entitled Lunar Eclipse. And it reads in first person in this sort of realistic way, but I think it was a dream. Um, I think it was an actual dream that sort of turned into a poem. So this is Lunar Eclipse. A secret trail through neighbors' backyards led to Janie's house. Blue light from our television flickering farther and farther behind. Janie was out front, dragging a stick through overgrown grass. Look, she said. The moon is covered in blood. She was always saying things. But the moon was a strange color. Dark red swollen like a tick. We took turns at a rotten slit in the fence, spying on the Bile twins, coaxing a girl to show them something. Their parents were never home. Moonlit, her bare skin seemed to smolder. Sometimes they come over, Ginny said. Those boys are wild. We watched for a while, then backed away, went inside for dinner. The house was dark, only glow a dim glimmer from the kitchen. Her parents were deaf and the phone was hooked up to a yellow light bulb. It would flash suddenly and the walls would shudder. I'm cooking tonight, Janie said. They teach late. Here. And she handed me a long knife. There was a frozen chicken on the counter, but I didn't know what to do with it. Experimenting, I slid my knife into the hole beneath, twisted until bloody pieces trailed out. Allow me, Janie said. Plunged her hand in and pulled out the rest. There was a scratching at the back screen door. It's the boys, she said. Let's go see. Love that. I love that image of the knife twisting. Long knife? Yes. What are you going to do with the long knife? Uh, what else are you going to do with the knife? <laughs> um, let's see. I swear I marked these, and then I swear they disappeared. I don't care. I didn't. So... We'll like, while you're searching for your poem, if if you are able to uh, text or your students, if they can't find the link, if they just go to um, YouTube and go to the normal public library channel, it's just playing there. And I, uh, yes, I think I did tell some friends that. So I hope I have. Great tip. Thank Thank you, Kathleen. Kathleen. Okay. I'll be quiet again, but I'm so excited by what I'm hearing. It's wonderful. All right, found it. The whole knife, knife twisting, twirling, found it. Good. All right, so this is another um, Trans-Siberian train poem it's called Hour 13. Sarah says desire creates bodies of lies. The fortune teller and her husband share our carriage. Silent, he rubs lotion into her, her arthritic hands. Concentric movements that grow larger and larger until her palms are cupped in his. She glares at us as if we plan to steal him. 
Sarah whispers, do you think he wants to be taken? Didn't we want to be? We are pushing into some unknown, but what remains, the body's defense as dust rises and sinks into denim crevices, is a human memory of a lover lifting my hips to the kitchen counter, tea stains and broken china cups, cups that keep breaking under his want. And then two, somewhere in the middle, hundreds of hours, the sound of the train strips you clean like a whetstone. We scrape arm to arm as we pass in corridors and bunks. At home, we go out of our way not to touch, but here our bodies learn to lie, to not cringe against stranger skin. I touch an orange and begin rasping it into rhymes. Swirls that bounce and dangle without break or end. My lover at home is like that, seemingly whole. Even as I cut away, I cut so carefully, his skin never splits, never drips out his heart, that resolved pit. Image. <laughs> and um, my twin sister's name is Sarah, so I have a Sarah that shows up in my poems sometimes too. <laughs> Uh, thinking about Russia and trains, naturally, one's thoughts turn to vodka. <laughs> this poem is entitled Vodka and Houseplants, Urbana, Illinois, 1996. Dennis Danica stands accused of robbing the till at the campus coffee house we tend, and I believe him innocent. Believe the boss just doesn't like foreigners. He told me slobs seem sneaky. What are they hiding, he wants to know. I invite Dennis over for a drink. Maybe some friends I bring along, he asks, and I agree, eager, eager to please. They all arrive together and Dennis roars in my doorway. The tanks are rumbling through the streets. He bows and hands me a potted orchid with the price tag still on that I carry in my arms most of the night. They don't seem to hear my offer of beers. Boris, busy lowering the blinds. Val turning the radio to a station I've never heard. Black bread to start, says Galena. Vodka to finish. When I protest I have nothing to mix with the liquor, they laugh and ask politely for pickles. All Americans have pickles, says Pasha. We drink vodka straight with brine chasers as the sun slides golden bars down my wall. Soon we are all on the floor in a dark room. Boris keeps telling jokes without punchlines, and he is toasted each time. Zavas, zavas. A few double over with laughter as though they are actually in pain. And Dennis whispers that these jokes are popular at home, that it's all in the telling, not the arrival. Tell me about home, I say, moving closer so the smoke from my cigarette dink tangles like rope between us. Tell me why you came here. Dennis sighs, pinches my lit cigarette, and smokes it down to the filter before burying the red end deep in orchid soil. He pats my cheek, not unkindly. We are not here, says Dennis. We are not here. We are not here. That is such a great last line. I love that last line. I love the ideal of narrative. Laura and I were talking about how we're both very narrative writers and narrative plays a really big theme in a lot of our poetry. Um, and one time, one of my fellow instructors asked me to come to her classroom and give a lecture on fiction. And so instead of giving a lecture on fiction, I wrote a poem. <laughs> As you do. Of As course. One Why not? So this poem is kind of a call and response, but it's me trying to explain the purpose of a lot of like prose elements and then how we need to investigate what's really important. So it's called For and Against Living a Story. I can't sleep, Sarah says. Tell me a story. Once, a girl wanted to turn herself into a benediction machine. Arrived at the St. Petersburg airport at two after midnight. Sarah says, you need specifics. It was deserted. The airport was like every other airport. You can see the blankness of it. Beige walls decorated with men and machine guns. Why her? Why here? She's running away, wanted forgiveness, to write in a country where it once meant life and death. Brown hair, jeans, a sign on her forehead that reads, break me. 
A good story must have conflict, Sarah says. The girl wanted to write, but what did she know? Her hands were myths, never still, never concrete details, always defining and redefining and so often wrong. She didn't speak Russian. She walked into the night. Sarah says, you need action. There were no official taxi cabs, no other women at 2 a.m. But it isn't enough, Sarah says. You need to open her up. Watch her realize empathy is difficult to learn. Here it is. The woman shot a man in Reno. Thought sex equaled love. That love was married to forgiveness. That love was bruised or not bruised, not gray like a dead man's fist. It is time someone lost something, Sarah says. Men pushed themselves away from black cars, walked towards the girl. They smelled American, tourist. Only one taxi man could win. He was mid-forties and wore a pink shirt scarred with the word cocaine. They danced, arrived to the hostel in exchange for $80, no 40, no 60. He grabbed her bag. She didn't ask his name. When does he pull a knife, Sarah asks. The car felt like a prison. The girl remembers sitting in county lockup with bloody hands. Watch neon lights flash by, carved out meanings, a liquor store, a pharmacy. He could take her anywhere, hostel or deserted park. She thought a hand on the door made her safe. The story needs closure, Sarah says. Okay, here it goes. A girl arrived alone at the St. Petersburg airport at 2 a.m. She thought, what the hell have I gotten myself into? She paid a one-armed man to drive her to her hostel. They passed an old cathedral, the entrance doors as tall and as notched as heaven. He pulled onto a block under construction. Tarps, crime scene tape, piles of wood and metal poles claimed the sidewalk. She couldn't open the door. It was locked. The car passed by and honked. So loudly she thought a gunshot went off. Maybe his definition of love is better than mine, she thought. Whatever happened next, she forgave. I really was in St. Petersburg Airport at 2 a.m. in Russia all by myself. Freaked out I was going to die. Many, many, I mean, many you could ago. have died. Yeah, many, that, many minutes ago. That seems ago. like maybe not a place you want to be at 2 a.m. Yeah. Although it is a romantic story, and I like thinking about I like that so much, uh, all the different um, elements that make up the story and, and the back and forth. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. my next poem, I think about, as Kara was reading, I was thinking about the story of um, Illinois and Chicago and the rest of Illinois, which is downstate. <laughs> I lived in Chicago for a while and realized, boy, they really don't think much about us at all up there. Not in a bad way. We just don't really cross their minds. But of course, downstate, we think a lot about Chicago. And that kind of tension really interests me. So this poem is called Downstate. We're headed downstate and Natalie's driving. She insisted. A Chicago girl who's driven across Paris, Tokyo, the left side of London streets like a pro, so she can handle this. And I wake from a doze to find us weaving on my country road, corn high on either side, and Natalie gabbling to herself, it's so quiet and there's no light but moon and nothing's moving and who knows, who knows what's going to come across the road, maybe a cow, a cow in the road, and what's in those fields that could be a zombie with a machete I can't see for, hmm. and she blows the horn just to have some noise, then I start speaking softly to her, like I would a skittish colt, while I'm thinking of the girl they found in the fields right around here when I was young and what had been done to her, the condition of the body. Her sister who married a close family friend soon after. That sister's eyes at the wedding, dead. How we took her away to Texas that night. How the marriage was threshed when she came back years later like she couldn't help herself. Left husband, children. Got in her car one day to go to work and just away. Where she stopped, bought a soda pop at Lefty's and decided to climb back inside a curse. Then I think of my own sister for a minute, my twin, 
but only for a minute because it's all I can stand, like hands around my throat to imagine how I would howl forever at the rustling of the stalks. That pain feels like it belongs here. Prairie madness, accidents with tractors, girls dragged into fields on nights just like this. And I'm still talking to Natalie who's calmed some. I tell her we're five miles out at most and she flinches at a coyote's cry. Werewolves, she whispers, ghosts and goblins. I think this place is haunted. And I answer Midwest stoic, there's no ghosts. Like a curse. Like a curse. Oh, there's no ghosts. Well, she read about dead girls and weddings <laughs> in Texas. And well, so I have a poem called Foreign Against Lineage that is even more depressing than dead girls and fields. <laughs> and I hate that I'm laughing because it's that ah, serious, but you gotta, no. you gotta laugh or you'll cry your eyes out. Running joke is I don't write happy poems. Or funny poems. I write traumatic poems. But okay. Born against lineage. I was looking at the lineage of like my parents and my grandparents and this is what happened. It's not funny. (laughs) I've been thinking of the lie in lineage when I should be thinking of the line or at least the age. In a couple's photograph when the photo is nothing but a space to save hunger. You can't trust the one who stares openly at the camera or the girl paragraphed in an oversized sweater, gazing awed at the boy in a tuxedo as he fails to invite her to the winter formal. In my grandparents' wedding photograph, you can't trust the best man or maid of honor. A shadow graph, they smile as she claps her hands together and his arms lay quiet like ropes at his sides. Her hands, his arms, all telegraphing a future of lies. A few years after the picture is taken, they will marry another soldier groom off to war. Years later, he will kill her. My grandmother will love this story like you love dark things in secret as Neruda wrote between shadow and soul. She believed you must suffer for sovereign love, but I thought lovers suffered regardless. We try to disown this flawed inheritance, ashamed to be pillars framing a shadowed, emptied center, to be brokenness diagramming itself. But those faces haunt like a song sung too soft, except the refrain which draws a melodious symmetry of knives and destitute bodies. Mm. Knives keep coming back. <laughs> knives, yes. And the haunting. I know I said there's no ghosts, but it feels like things are kind of haunted. Mm-hmm. There's ghosts. And, and um, this next one I wrote, I was trying to remember. I know I wrote it uh, in a feeling of being haunted. Some horrible thing had happened, and they're coming so fast and furious these days. It's hard to remember. Um, but some terrible political thing inspired this, and I wrote uh, All American Extraterrestrial. All my life, I've lived between the lines of tilled fields, luxuriated in order, created by man and machine. The land is owned here and known, so when a patch grows wild, we lay blame. There is safety in deeds in bills of sale signed plainly, even if most landlords here are absentee. What I see every evening on my drive home from work is green, mile after mile, swaying soybean leaves, barley shocks, tall stalks of ripening corn. Farm boy rhymes with Illinois, and these fields are lousy with them in summer. They are beautiful too, because what I'm talking about is a certain flavor of it, beauty, The boys shirtless on tractors in late June sun, side dressing nitrogen and crop scouting rows. The blight now is how strange everything seems since spacemen came in the night to take me off planet, deposited and sleeping in a house that looks like my house, in a town very like my small town, in a state familiar. I've been in this state before, this country, I'm sure of it, but no, 
you've all changed faces. Oh, in this country, such a beautiful, strong sense of place. That's what I love. Absolutely. So, so good. So good. Alrighty. Um, I think this will be my last train poem. I promise. Last train poem. Maybe. But I feel like it also has a good sense of place, despite the fact that we're traveling through place. Mm -hmm. For and against slow days. And my for and against poems are arguments for and against things, because I'm always on the fence. If you've ever met me, you know, (laughs) I'm incapable of making like a decision. Mm -hmm. And I'm always like looking, but, but this way, but look at it this way, but no, no, look at it this way. And so these poems are for and against things that I'm trying to argue and try to understand better. So for and against slow days. On a slow day, it is easy to tend words on a train, to create my own pastoral. One, a swaying, cackling campfire, as if I am protecting a dozen goats from a dozen dark dangers. Two, a forest with dripping leaves, hissing slide and falling pop of gravity, snakes unwinding as if fruit for the picking. And three, a piano playing the same two thick, lingering notes over and over. It is easy to believe that these slow moments mean something. Snow globe moments, when lovers fall, the flitter inside those domes, like the bone chips we pass as snow and are slowed by water and antifreeze. Insulation that refuses to leave us to our realities. One lover forever caught, secretly piecing together a Christmas tree the other does not want. Marcus Aurelius said, many grains of incense fall on the same altar. One sooner, one later, it makes no difference. I know that we fall, that the order does not matter. On a slow day, it is easy to believe. Easy to believe that only nothing can return to nothing. So the soul must go somewhere after death. Easy to forget desire is a hazardous thing to reveal. On a slow day, it is easy to forget we flee to find ourselves to escape the familiar that erodes, only to fall into the same routines of erosion, breathing, sleeping, le deux désir de durer. It is easy to fall into the alternate lives we shepherd in, but some days no poetry will serve. Eventually, slow clotted nights break into snow or break into fire and a goat wanders off into the mouths of coyotes. I know that we fall before it doesn't matter. Marcus Aurelius. Oof. <laughs> it's like we're making a list for and against. I love it. No. Um, and those bone chips. Kara told me that in snow globes, they did use bone chips mm-hmm. to um, denote the snow, which I had never heard yeah. and found quite troubling. Uh, agreed. Kathleen agreed. Uh, this is a troubling poem, and I will warn you that sometimes it, it I, you can probably tell I get emotional when I read, so I'll try to, as I tell my students, I'll try not to cry, um, but uh, I feel like these days somebody just barely touches me and I burst into a million pieces, so I'll do my best. This poem is entitled Charlie Horse. While you sleep, decisions are made. Your body, so long on your side, casually switches allegiances and seizes territory like a guest suddenly lunging across the dinner table at the host. If this were war, and it is, you just lost. Aerial view, a drone might survey the damage. Rough terrain, expanse of sweaty limbs surprised into agonized spasm, eyes squeezed shut. You're dreaming, sure, but the pain is real. The way they say a patient feels everything on the operating table, then forgets. This is night. In day, thoughts and bones remain your own, right? You're awake. It only feels like dream, like starring in your own surreal show. Take this scene, 
that's you. Teaching, first week of class. Mind blown at the faces. Keen and raw like baby birds who wait on your worm words. They yawn covertly under bangs and baseball caps. Smile shyly at their feet. Late teens, all are beautiful, shiny, a little zitty. Seemingly unconcerned with the grammar test that's next. One student breathes the periodic table for another course, her mouth forming hydrogen, nitrogen, noble gas. Two boys softly toss a hacky sack back and forth between the rows, ignore minor glowering from those in the seams. Cross currents do not bother most, headphoned and Apple Androided as they are. And then the bell sounds and you announce the day's vocabulary word laid, you say, which makes them laugh even when you clarify past form of laden, to put a load or burden on. Something goes wrong then. They stop paying attention because a bell is ringing again, but shriller, more insistent, and from everywhere at once. When you freeze, they are kinder than they need to be. This must be your first, one says, gets up to close and lock the door, while the others, in pairs and silent, turn heavy tables over. Wow. I upset myself. <laughs> I upset Beautiful. I feel like I should not read my next one. Well, but you must. But I shouldn't. But you must. I shouldn't. No, that is amazing. I love the the emotion that goes into it. Something that, unfortunately, I think this next generation might be taking for granted. The fact that you have to do active shooter drills. It's just. Um, it's just the it way still, it is. And it shouldn't. We uh, did tornado drills occasionally. That's right. And that's it. That was that was it. I can't even imagine. I can't either. It is unimaginable. This is kind of like, I have one poem that has funny moments. Let's do it. But it's not really even funny. <laughs> I don't even know why I chose it. Um, probably because a lot of my poems deal with place and what's real and what's not real and, well, highways and guns. This one's foreign against effacement. Stillness reminds you to flee. And reminds you of the loneliness of fleeing. Between trains, oops, I lied. Between train stations and all night diners rest the best motels. At night, almost beyond our Jeep headlights, the Santa Rosa fever motels, southwestern decor seems wistful. Lizards stenciled in the second between steps. Filigree carved benches imprinting the skin if you linger. The mirroring of lace of spiders, those permanent residents, and other small gods stalled mid-song, pipers of dark desert music. This motel knows its customers' demands, knows being the first motel off the first exit of a town called Truth or Consequence feels like fate. And who can resist? Fate is easier to see the farther from home we get, or maybe just easier to accept. Between the small desert town and the two handguns we carry, my lover joked I'm fated to write cowboy poetry. <laughs> Poems about a rider astride a painted mare, horizon staring as a camera lens pans out, as time erodes the body but not the land until the cowboy is just a speck of dust and the regret he lived only one landscape of beauty. And as my lover laughed at me, country music wavered from the Aftershock's diner. The night was clotted, refusing downpour, but spitting soft reminders of the inevitable. Even in the middle of nowhere, the night is never left to itself. The station whites always beckon. You would think the motel's curtains would be thicker against the forever light, but the thin stripes only dampen light, like drizzle teases the ground. I waited for the gods to rekindle their song, lizards to two-step, my partner to pocket my hands and draw me from the bench I lingered on. Whoever said effacement was all or nothing was wrong. 
Night effaces mountains. Oil derricks efface prairies. Highways are erased by mile markers, reminding us of not where we are, but how far until our next destination. There were some guns in that poem. Texas. Yeah, and my family yeah. loves their no, guns. No judgment. I'm we, sorry. We love them around here too. I was just gonna say. Um, I mean, not not myself personally, uh, but you know, it's it's America. They're quite popular. Uh, but I was thinking about this next poem, which has some violence and weaponry in it, and it was inspired by an actual baby shower, and also by a, a sort of shift in the way scary movies are made, which seems to emphasize all the most horrible things we can do to the human body um, in the most torturous ways possible. This poem is entitled Baby Shower Torture Porn, Rolling Meadows, Illinois. This is how I do it, she says. Strawberry cake with the buttercream frost and the knife, when it enters, slides in clean. Pretend it's his eyeball, she says twists the knife quickly, then inserts her fork. Delicious, she says, raising a bite to her mouth. Yes, says the hostess, yes. The puree keeps it moist. I'd use a screwdriver to the jugular. You have to be fast. Tea, she asks me. The only babyless attendee pours hot herbal into my cup. We all have tea in bone china, decorated with daisies. And as the steam rises, my blonde Kate Spaded couchmate murmurs, boiling water and a hammer to the skull. No sugar for me, thanks. Not that I'd enjoy it, she says, studying my face. But I would take a wrench to his knees. Who, I say. Anyone, she says. You'll see. She pats my belly and tells me she keeps a butcher knife under her pillow. And then the men come in, the husbands, home from work, in flat front khakis and collared shirts. They are shy and coloned and tugging at their ties, but they eat the cake we press on them. We insist they eat every last slice. So good. I love how you use playful violence. I just get violence without the playful. You don't think it's playful? I Not think mine, violence yours. Is, I think yours is, is plenty, plenty playful. Um, I meant to read one of the poems that we decided, I know, and I, I, think I skipped over one line, but I didn't know. print it out, so oh. we're going to stuck with a different one. Yeah. We thought we would read some new things to end, yes. um, things that aren't published quite yet, but maybe someday might be. Fingers, Fingers crossed. crossed. Fingers crossed. Um, and the violence remind me of this one. It's called Obeyed Ending as an Accessory. I don't know how to skin a fish. I have never asked for instructions. Never woken at dawn to be a patient predator on the other end of a line. I imagine fish scales as shiny sequin dresses, as mermaid tails, as costumes like ours, our own clothes and skin that let us masquerade as something else. Too many Disney movies, I guess. Mm -hmm. My mother once said, I epically failed as a Girl Scout. I kept falling into traps. The one where I personified everything was my dynamite. As real as any bear trap, as any still jaws around my ankle. What if the trees grieved the infant or aged limbs we burned in our fires? What if our bodies confused the wind, got it lost from itself? What if the ground was tired of being bruised by our feet? What if the rocks thrown into the river really drowned? What about the fish trapped in nets, trying to get somewhere just out of reach? How air strangles them as it gives us life, and how the wind must hate knowing it participates in our own mass killings. I love that you think about what the, Violence what, the wind, <laughs> what the wind is thinking about. I should be thinking more about the wind and the wind's feelings <laughs> and the fish and the nets. I wish I had come up with that title, Baby Shower. <laughs> that just, whatever, whatever. That, that, came, that, came from the, that came from the wind. All right, I think we're doing okay on time, Kathleen. I think we're okay. Good, great. Okay, this is one. I wrote a couple poems, and I'll just read one. Um, they were entitled Word Problems. 
And this particular word problem is entitled asynchronous learning, as any teachers in the classroom these past COVID years are aware, we are often asked to teach uh, through Zoom online. They call these different versions asynchronous when we're not meeting together at the same time, when we're not synced up. It's such a horrible term. So I thought I'd put it in a poem. This is called asynchronous learning. I sat in algebra and thought about boys. Like magic, they appeared outside the classroom window. Ms. Goss droned on with her impossible equations while I watched two rugby-shirted blondes pass briskly just beneath the glass. No one else seemed to note their progress, all heads bent studiously to hieroglyphic sums. Some thought it strange that our school sat surrounded on all sides by corn, but I liked the swaying stalks, tall and tightly aligned in spring, a bright green army. I noticed the boys were dragging something between them, spied a shock of dyed blue mohawk and misfit stickered skateboard that bespoke sophomore thrasher Bob Tosh, and when his head snapped side angle, I saw his zero of a mouth shouting something solved into silence as the planted rose swallowed them all. Here was math I could follow. Two boys clad head to toe in polo plus one trailer park punk whose dad had inexplicably gone to Harvard equaled a beating in the fields. How dare he? How dare any of us, I mused, scanning the room for an ally who might take the hit instead of me. When no one met my eye, I began to raise my hand half-heartedly to tell, felt a sharp kick to my shin. Susan, the cheerleader assigned a seat beside me who liked Hallmark cards, gin and tonics, and her sleepy quarterback boyfriend was displeased. He was asking for it, she whispered, then passed me a Luden's cherry cough drop in solidarity. Well, I tried, I thought placed the sweet spoils on my tongue and wondered what it felt like to be punched. Outside, late afternoon sun bled fading orange over tall corn and violet and solid, a wall impassable, even if someone wanted. Pay attention, Ms. Goss said then, or you'll fail this class. And indeed, I did fail that class, Karen. <laughs> We're, we're poets, not mathematicians. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's funny. Someone was just, um, I was in some kind of lecture or whatever, and they were saying that they pulled students in college classes to see what they were thinking about during lectures. We were talking about, yep. They weren't, they weren't thinking about the lectures. They were thinking about what? Food. Food and sleep Food and, and naps and, and naps. girls and boys and girlfriends and boyfriends. And Can you imagine how much worse asynchronous stuff is? I mean, if there's like no accountability, you just sit there and hit play and like doodle. I do too. All right, so um, here is a poem that kind of maybe doesn't go with that at all. <laughs> um, I like to do stained glass. So this is called Stained by Numbers. I used to love cartwheels and handstands, diving to the bottom of a pool to retrieve a diamond ring or a lost scrunchie. Didn't fear being turned upside down or whirled around. Not the pressure of water pushing air from my lungs. Didn't fear the underworld fruit. I was no Persephone. No Hades was going to fall in love with me in my tattered one-piece swimsuit. My mother was not going to kill the world for half a year if I disappeared. I couldn't tell you what a pomegranate looked like. Too focused on the apple. I thought I was only a female body, not a body of knowledge. I knew so little. I knew oranges dyed my fingernails the color of sunrise. I knew wasp nests begged to be pinatas. I knew my hair was more baby snake than tadpole, more than dead bodily excess. I knew my pit bull mix, my pit bull mix was not Cerberus, even though he bit that one boy who tried to cross my river sticks. <laughs> I knew better mediums existed beyond melted crayons and paint by numbers. A stained glass cutter that twists and turns with each wrist flick. The one that only starts the break and awaits the right amount of pressure. The soldering iron and wire mistaken for silver neck extension collar. I was 
that girl body kaleidoscoping. I didn't see the danger in the light that cut through all her twirling limbs. Oh, that girl oh body, God. that girl body. <laughs> uh, I've got some twirling in this poem Ooh. too. Yes. Man, there's so many great images. I just <laughs> I have to spend some more time with your, your poetry reading on my own, um, which is so pleasurable. This is my final poem, and I think, yes, we have time, great. Um, and it's uh, the title poem from my, my little chat book, Hack. I don't think I've had a chance to read this out loud before, so I'm, I'm excited to do so. I wrote this one as a, yay, as with a, an earlier poem in a fit of rage. <laughs> and I can't remember, honestly, what that fit of rage was about, but it doesn't matter. There's so many fits of rage lately. Um, so this one is entitled Hack. Oh, and it has my twin sister. Sarah hates her 12-year-old's yo mama jokes so much, not just because they're offensive, and they are, but because they're hack. He might as well tell them while smashing watermelons, she says, then mutters something mean about ukuleles and prop comics. I silently agree that my nephew is not very good at comedy, but then neither are we. In elementary, Sarah and I switched classrooms to fool our teachers year after year. Our fellow students on board, then bored, since it always worked. The same prank from third through sixth, hack. Except for Miss Thaxton, the coolest teacher in school who noticed fast when my sister took my place in the back row, but just winked and kept passing out the spelling quizzes that I did well on that she decorated with stickers. If I'm not careful, Miss Thaxton will hijack this poem the enormous cardboard Rubik's Cube in her classroom that fit three children, and another hideaway behind tall, wall-length bookshelves with hard floor purple carpeted, dotted with pillows, and designed for book lovers like me to relax, take our time. On her desk, Stephen King novels, and one called The Plant People, about a town full of humans mysteriously turned into cacti that landscaped my nightmares for years. She was young with long black hair that made me grow my own locks long and her story in sadly. I won't tell that part here because stories bring no one back. Hack. Down the hall, Mr. Wesley taught math for the summers off. He droned on. He drank at work. Hack. To be a twin is hack. Who needs two of anything so alike? Unless one is defective, perhaps, and writes to try to hide. Hack. The college boys next door throwing parties every weekend with cranking bass and twirling girls just like they went to a real school in a real town instead of this one. Heck, winter is hack, relying on white drifts and weak sun, our windows frosted while we sip hot cocoa, topped with marshmallows designed to look like snow, hack for days. The USA started strong, had a new point of view, a stance. You may not have liked all that witch burning. The massacre of natives and slaves in chains, but let's admit she could spin a yarn. Darn, we've lost our way. Can't find the thread to tug to take us back to the beginning unless... Knock, knock. Who's there? A broken pencil. Broken pencil who? Never mind. It's pointless. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get a knock, knock joke. Yeah. Yay. 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 <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Kara Doris and Laura Bandy. So wonderful to hear your poems. It was so great to, to see you and hear you side by side. I know a Zoom reading is difficult because you can't hear the reactions of your audience, but there you were so attentively listening to each other and encouraging of each other. And it just, the way things fit together is just really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I have to give credit to Kara. We got together and, and took several hours and, and talked about our poems and how they might fit together. So <laughs> I think it worked out nicely. And it, was, it was a lot of fun. Thank what you a great thing of me. Yes, absolutely. Thank <laughs> great you. Great thing to do. I'm glad. And thank you for reading some new work out loud. I know that's really a good way to test it. And hack sounded really good out oh, loud. Thanks. That's terrific. I want to um, check in with John and see if there are any questions or comments from YouTube. Uh, and while he's looking, uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of interesting coincidences. As I was hearing the birds in your poem, I wanted to let you know that um, we have a beautiful bird photography exhibit up right now at the library. So that was in my mind. And uh, 
table full of books about birds. So that was a fun little coincidence going on. Also, you mentioned ukuleles at the end, and you can <laughs> check those out at our library oh. and learn how to play them. Uh, and then when you mentioned Moscow and, and Russia and vodka and pickles, <laughs> it ties in with my life right now and a library pro program that we had last night. Um, we have a collaboration with the local theater, Heartland Theater, that's mm -hmm. doing a play called Life Sucks that's loosely based <laughs> on uh, Uncle Vanya, which takes oh, wonderful. In, uh, in Russia, lots of vodka drinking. In fact, my character walks around with a bottle of vodka every <laughs> now and then. Uh, and part of our, our library materials that we brought to a display includes something called Open Mic Night in Moscow. <laughs> so somehow uh, everything was tying together. Uh, and I just loved both of you. What a what a sense of place, as you've noted for each other and you're rooted in. I was so sad about the story of the girl by the side of the road. You know, I grew up here in central Illinois, so I'm very aware of that story. I'm sure it's the same uh, story. Um, and as devastated as you are by active shooter drills and that and so it's coming out so beautifully in your poems such compassion in your poems while also the the bluntness the saying saying what it is letting it be letting letting it be um and and Kara even though you said it's not that funny <laughs> I certainly noticed the word play. That's a different kind of, you know, there's a, not exactly fun, fun, but boy, that, that was really coming through. So, um, thank you so much. Also the, also the Chicago versus downstate says I grew up here and then I lived 20 years in Chicago and came back here very aware of it. But you know, way more aware of it than I was growing up. But now it's like, oh, I guess we're all downstate. <laughs> so I think there, John's telling us there aren't actual questions for you there, just lots of uh, positive comments. Uh, so <laughs> you can check back in with, with your people. And if anybody, as I said, wasn't able to. To see it from the beginning, it'll be um, archived at the Normal Public Library YouTube channel, and they'll be able to see your face and your names and click on it and uh, listen listen to the program from the start. <laughs> and those of you who are list who are listening, who are poets, student poets, our next poetry related event is an open mic on February 15th, also in this seven to eight slot. You two, of course, can come back, but you can bring all your students. Oh, that's great. Uh, and that's by Zoom. Mm -hmm. And so and we would all be in the Zoom room together. And you would just go to the Normal Public Library website, click on the calendar of events, find Poetry is Normal, the open mic for February 15th, and register for it. And usually everybody reads one or two poems, usually two. If there's a big bunch, we might have to reduce it, but usually there's plenty of time. Our, our theme, because it's close to Valentine's Day, but not Valentine's Day, is love letters, the Ooh. idea of letters. So it doesn't have to be romantic love. It could be love letters to the world, if you'd like, but it could be romantic. And we also have people who are not on theme. So please feel free to come back and bring your students to the open mic. But thank you so much for being with us for Poetry is Normal Presents at the Normal Public Library. We've been listening to Laura Bandy and Kara Doris, and it's just been lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was, it was a delight. <laughs> it was. It was really fun to spend time with you, Kara, yeah. and, and to celebrate the poetry. Yeah, so, absolutely. Thank you, and go to your public yeah. libraries. They are yeah. temples of knowledge, and they're the keeper of the books, and they are my superheroes. All right, thank you so much.